So uh, today it's uh, our great fortune and my pleasure to be hosting Dr. Jones Albertus. Um, Becca is the acting deputy director of the Solar Energy Technology Office, which is known to many of us as the Sunshot Program in Washington. Um, that office has been instrumental in uh, trying to do a lot with small resources in terms of bringing solar to uh, cost competitiveness with coal. And uh, their, their research impact and, and particularly their impact on uh, creating and um, informing the community of US researchers in solar has been absolutely tremendous. So Becca has been with Sunshot, uh, that is CETO, Solar Energy Technology Office, for four years. Uh, prior to that, she was in the uh, private sector working on um, uh, dilute nitride materials for PV. And uh, prior to that, she received her PhD in material science from Berkeley and undergraduate from <coughs> Princeton. Um, I'll mention that uh, uh, I want to get on with the talk, but I, I will mention that papers like this, this is um, 2016 paper, right? Um, in uh, Prague Photovoltaics, uh, Becca is the first author, are absolutely essential. Um, anyone who wants to get involved in PV or remain relevant in PV should read these uh, papers to inform ourselves of how to really move the needle on global carbon. So uh, I find these very influential and they really help me guide my own research. So um, I hope this is informative to everyone else as well. All right, thank you. Becca? Thanks very much, Raf. It's my pleasure to be here uh, talking with you all today. Uh, so I'll be talking, uh, I titled my talk, The Potential for Solar. And I'm excited to give a little bit of historical context about how much solar has grown and the advances that have occurred really recently, uh, as well as talking a little bit about where things can go in the future. Uh, so before I dive in, I just wanted to uh, give an overview of solar technologies. I imagine that most of you in this room are pretty familiar with photovoltaics. And these are uh, semiconductor materials that, uh, you know, most commonly silicon, that directly convert light into electricity. Uh, the cells shown here are integrated and strung together in modules, which then make up systems like you see on this rooftop. Uh, one of maybe the less highlighted but exciting things about PV is that it maintains its efficiency at any size, effectively. So you can have very, very small systems that have the same power efficient generation efficiency as very large systems, uh, you know, roughly speaking. And that's very different than most power generation systems that are um, based on generators and turbines that need sufficient size in order to be efficient. Uh, the other technology, which may not be as uh, well known to all of you, is concentrating solar thermal power. And that's the picture shown here. So with concentrating solar thermal power, or CSP, as we call it, um, you use mirrors called heliostats to concentrate all the light onto a single receiver. In this case, the receiver is shown here. It's a, a power tower. So you concentrate all the light onto this receiver where it's turned into a heat. And that heat can then be stored until it's needed. Then it's used um, to run a conventional uh, turbine generation system. So again, what, uh, what's, what's exciting about CSP is that it, it can be inherently incorporate storage. So you can inherently have solar electricity on demand, not just when the sun is shining. Today, the large um, dominance of technology that's been installed at solar is PV. In the US, CSP is about 2% of installed solar technology. But again, um, CSP allows for sort of higher value solar energy. As I said, I, I, I see this as a really exciting time for solar. Uh, it's just been amazing how much change has occurred over the last decade and even, even more recently than the last decade. In the last 10 years, we've had 100-fold times more solar generation uh, installed in the US, going from less than 100th of 1% of US electricity to, for the first time last year, generating more than 1% of US electricity. It's taken solar from a very expensive niche technology to a viable electricity source that last year, for the first time, was the largest share of new electricity generation capacity added to the grid for the first time. So 39% of all new power generation capacity added last year was solar, was photovoltaics, with natural gas and wind being the next largest shares. 
uh, the solar industry has also been a tremendous source of job creation. And that has you know, gone commensurately with the increase in installations. So you see here over the same time period, uh, the growth in jobs in the solar industry. There were 260,000 jobs in the solar industry last year. And solar has been growing at a rate that's 17 times faster than the overall economy. More than half of these jobs, the ones in dark blue here, are installation jobs, so actually installing the new PV systems, with the next three largest shares being project development, sales and distribution, and manufacturing across the supply chain. Now, as I said, 1% of US electricity comes from solar, but there are uh, some states, parts of the country, where those numbers are much higher, and that's shown here. These numbers are from last year. Every time, essentially, I look at these numbers, they, they grow. And the ones you see next year will be, um, in many cases, significantly higher than here. So you have California, which last year got 13% of its electricity from solar, uh, a little over 1% of that from CSP, uh, commercial and residential systems, distributed PV, like the picture of PV on the rooftop that I had there next. And then this largest share from utility scale systems, like this Topaz plant, which is 550 megawatt plant in California. And you see we have states, Hawaii, Vermont, Nevada, all over 7% uh, electricity from PV and growing. Worldwide, the trends are fairly similar. This state is a year older from 2015. But solar generated about 1% of electric worldwide electricity in 2015. Uh, and again, with some countries in this case uh, having much higher penetrations. In this case, Italy, Germany at about 8% being the, being the leaders. And solar is projected to continue to grow. I'm showing here um, baseline projections that are from uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab's Regional Energy Deployment System model. And uh, for 2030, these are um, in pretty good agreement with uh, the Department of Energy's Energy Information Admin um, Administration, EIA's projections as well. And what you see for the orange bars here, which are solar, is that in sort of the baseline case, baseline expectations, solar is expected to grow to about 5% of US electricity in 2030. Um, and then roughly 15% EIA's projections are a little lower, about 12% by 2050. But again, significantly greater um, amounts of U.S. electricity growing over the next few decades. Uh, and at the same time, projections have uh, historically underestimated PV's growth. These are uh, U.S. projections from EIA's annual energy outlook. And the black dots are the actual installations in the U.S. And then the lines here are the projections for solar installations um, for subsequent uh, subsequent years. And basically, the trend you see is that the actual black dots in general you know, are, are consistently above uh, the lines where they're projected. Same has been true worldwide, looking at the um, IEA's World Energy Outlook, where the historical, the actual projections in black uh, continue to exceed uh, historical projections. So why has uh, solar growth been been uh, growing so rapidly. One of the big factors is uh, it's been rapidly declining in cost. So again, U.S. installations growing. We're seeing uh, deployment or sorry uh, costs here's for system costs falling by about a factor of four at the same time that these installations are growing so rapidly. Now that was in system price. I'm going to say a few more things about cost, but switch to a different metric, uh, the levelized cost of electricity. Uh, when talking about uh, costs of solar electricity, I really prefer the LCOE metric to system costs or other cost metrics. And that's because it's a life cycle cost. Uh, it includes the cost of installing the system, the cost of operating, the operations maintenance costs of the system, tax implications, through the actual taxes paid and depreciation expense, as well as the cost of the, the financing, the cost of the capital, which um, is a significant factor in overall cost, in addition to any residual value or decommissioning costs. So it's the full costs over the life cycle 
divided by the um, power production over the lifetime. So not just how much power is produced uh, when the system is installed, but it accounts for how much degradation the system uh, experiences over time. So more reliable systems produce more power over the lifetime. That's a lower life cycle cost. This is also influenced significantly by where these systems are, are installed, the actual uh, kilowatt hours per kilowatt. So that's, that's actually like the climate, how much sun is there, what's the temperature of the region. Uh, so now moving to LCOE and just talking more about cost reduction, uh, very recently we announced through the Department of Energy uh, the accomplishment of a, a big metric for us. So in 2011, uh, the Department of Energy had announced the SunShot Initiative. At that time, the big challenge for solar was that it was too expensive. It was about a factor of four more expensive than conventional electricity sources. So for solar to become really a viable electricity source, its cost had to fall. And, and the SunShot Initiative was launched to drive those cost reductions forward. The goal was by 2020 <coughs> to achieve, for utility scale systems, the large systems, six cents a kilowatt hour. We announced in September that that goal was achieved this year. So again, these, these factor of more than four cost reductions happening even faster than um, was what was seen to be a very aggressive goal um, when the Sunshine Initiative was, was announced. Now, the Sunshine Initiative also had goals for the other sectors, uh, residential and commercial systems. And in red here, you see again the costs, uh, the levelized cost of energy in 2010 in those sectors. Um, and green is the bars in 2017. So costs have fallen dramatically in these sectors as well, but we haven't uh, achieved the SunShot 2020 goals yet in those sectors um, in the blue bars. They still need further cost reduction, particularly in the soft costs, the customer acquisition, the installation, the interconnection, the permitting costs. Those still need to fall uh, further to reach the 2020 goals. So cost reduction was a major factor in this increase in deployment we've seen. Um, policy and incentives have been the other major factor. As you see on this map, just showing the large number of states in the U.S. that have renewable portfolio standards that are driving additional investment in renewables. We also have the federal investment tax credit, which is a 30% tax credit, so effectively a 30% reduction in the upfront system cost, not in the full LCOE, but in the upfront system cost of a PV system. Both of those have also been you know, very important factors in driving the rapid growth we've seen in solar installations. So as I said before, when the Sunshine Initiative was launched in 2011, the big challenge was cost. How do we get solar costs down? Today, solar's become a viable electricity source, 1% of our electricity generation, and the challenges are changing. Uh, now the, the challenge is there's our grid integration. How do we get solar power, which is a variable power source, which is um, being installed on the distribution side of the, the grid, how do we integrate that well into the electricity grid and maintain a reliable, resilient grid? As well as how do we um, deal with, I'll talk more about um, the declining value of PV. As more PV is installed, its value decreases. Uh, and it turns out that continuing to focus on cost reduction is an important strategy for that, but um, this is no longer the only focus and it's no longer uh, the only challenge and opportunity with solar. So saying more about uh, grid integration challenges, I'll put up the schematic here. So historically, our electricity grid has looked something like this. We have generation systems on the left, they flow through transmission lines to a substation out onto the distribution system. Power flows in one direction. With solar, we have solar on the generation transmission side, but we also see solar on the distribution system. Solar is not the only distributed energy resource, um, but it is the most significant one to date. And with lots of generation on the distribution system, uh, when it reaches high enough high enough penetrations, you can actually have cases where you have power flowing in two directions and not just one. This creates new sets of challenges uh, for the grid. For example, ensuring that the systems that are designed to regulate voltage and frequency on the grid 
aren't uh, experiencing reliability issues due to operating more readily. Uh, there are challenges in how does solar begin to support grid reliability itself through voltage, frequency, power quality regulation. Um, as solar becomes a more significant power source on the grid, there's also the need to manage uh, and integrate it um, and deal with its variability. So we've always had load that has high amounts of variability, but having variability on the power generation side um, is something that is being brought from wind and solar. There's also a need for new standards for how these devices integrate and operate and what they're allowed to do with the grid. So just some of the challenges go to a similar schematic, but that illustrates, in addition, as we're moving to what we call a modernized grid, um, the Department of Energy has a, a large initiative called the Grid Modernization Initiative, which is looking at how we take our, our grid and move to a modernized structure. We need to pay attention with solar in making this, um, integrating into a secure grid with communication and data you know, at the forefront. Uh, and in addition, one that uh, operates and works within an evolving energy marketplace. Uh, so as solar becomes a larger share of our power generation, one challenge is, can we make it available on demand? As I said before, you know, as a variable power generation source, uh, there are certainly challenges. And what's shown here in blue is the t sort of a typical or an example load profile, um, what electricity generation typically might need to meet. In orange is uh, the, an example of the well-known duck curve. So you see solar generation that happens during daytime <laughs> hours. And what it does to the net load, this is basically the load minus the solar generation, is it means that you can have a very low dip, especially in sort of morning, midday times when the load isn't quite as high and solar generation can be quite high. And then as you get toward evening and solar generation is falling, um, you go back to that normal load curve, but with a much steeper ramp than you have in the usual case. So through storage or shifting of load, there are opportunities to better match solar generation and demand and take what is represented by this red arm. Instead of having this fall down so far, take this area of generation in red and shift it uh, over to the evening hours where it's needed. Or conversely, you could imagine shifting some of the load from these hours into these, these hours here. Uh, but effectively, how do we better match the supply of solar electricity with the demand and need for, need for solar? And um, I guess I'll say the, the challenges with the duck curve, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, are that as this net load falls lower and lower, it can um, reach the levels of sort of minimum generation and, and contracts that um, exist for sort of base load generation. And what that means, it's really just an economic issue. It means you'll end up throwing away some of that solar power. Um, it's called curtailment. At low levels, when curtailment happens just in you know, certain days in March, like has been the main case with the duck curve to date, there's not a huge economic impact on solar. But as you get higher and higher penetrations of solar, electricity curtailment can have an important economic impact. And then from the grid operator's perspective, managing an even steeper um, growth of load ramping is an additional challenge. Uh, but there are also important opportunities from the grid integration side with solar electricity. And in particular, putting solar on the distribution system offers opportunities for resilience that we're just starting to look at. When you have solar on the distribution system, if you have a case where there's a loss of electricity, where there's a blackout, it is possible for solar and other distributed energy resources to restart um, areas of the grid, for those areas to begin to work together and supply power while overall power generation is being restored. So there's some really exciting opportunities on the resilience side that are possible by having solar and other distributed energy resources on the distribution grid. We have a project uh, that's just kicking off at Lawrence Livermore National Lab uh, through the Grid Modernization Initiative that's looking specifically at how to use 
solar and storage and other distributed resources um, to be able to provide power during blackouts and help restart the grid. Another opportunity is with concentrating solar power. As I talked about before, concentrating solar power uh, inherently incorporates storage or can inherently incorporate storage to allow for solar on demand. Uh, it's also possible with the same components for a concentrating solar system to create plants that operate more like peakers. Um, plants shown here when you have for the same sized um, power block for a 50 megawatt generator, if you have um, a larger, or sorry, a smaller solar field and, and smaller storage units, you can have more of a peaker plant configuration. If you keep the power block the same and you scale up the size of the solar field and the size of the storage units, you can move to um, what we call intermediate or base load plants. So basically with the same technology components, you can have flexibility in the kind of um, power plant that's built uh, depending on what the grid needs. And then talking a little bit about um, declining value that I mentioned earlier. So as we see the penetration of PV um, on the grid increase, there's a decline in the, in the value of PV. So this is another challenge to work on. This plot here is, is showing this. It's actually showing it from the, the um, sort of an effective cost perspective. So what this is showing is, is you, for a case study of California, um, and this is Paul Denholm's work at NREL. For a case study of California, looking at as you put more solar on the grid, this is the total amount of California's load that is met by solar energy. So as you put more solar on the grid, how does the effective cost of that solar change due to curtailment, due to solar energy that can't be used because there's too much of it um, at a time when it's not needed? Another way to look at that is it's sort of the, the energy value of, of solar is, is going down. So the blue line is, is the overall cost for all of the solar on the grid. But what's more important in terms of where's, where you find an economic limit is the marginal cost. So for every bit of solar that's added, what is that marginal cost? And you see that in this case, at about 20% um, solar on the grid, you see the marginal cost going, going steadily up suggesting that it would not be economically viable to add more solar onto the grid. This is for what I'll call an inflexible grid, um, where flexibility is the ability of the grid to um, rapidly uh, adapt to changing supply and load demands. So this is looking at sort of maybe the structure of the grid we have today. There's lots of ways, and this is probably too small to read, but there's lots of ways that the, to increase the flexibility of the grid, and this kind of outlines them. From, a, from an operation perspective, there's things like better forecasting of when you'll have renewable energy generation, uh, having more flexibility reserves. There's also allowing for the use of um, variable renewables of wind and solar to provide grid services. Uh, such that um, there may not be as high a need for sort of a minimum um, generation from, from uh, other generators so that more renewables can be used. Uh, there is flexibility in when load is provided. Uh, here, this focuses mostly on demand response. Um, I'm personally also very interested in exploring the overall uh, ability of load to be shifted across um, not just demand response, but across general usage of electricity load. And uh, if there's any of you in the audience who have done any work on that, I'd uh, love to connect with you afterwards. Um, more flexible generation. So if other electricity generators are able to ramp their production up and down um, more rapidly, then that makes it easier to adjust to rapid changes in supply and demand. Uh, there's also uh, transmission expansion. So if the regions over which we balance energy supply and demand <laughs> become larger, then again, that can accommodate a more flexible grid. Um, you know, For example, if you're able to generate, take your excess solar generation in, in Arizona and ship it you know, far across to an area that doesn't have sun at that moment, uh, then you 
have a natural way to utilize that excess solar power. And last here is, is storage. I'll talk more about storage uh, later. Storage is probably the biggest lever on overall flexibility, uh, but today it's one of the most expensive. And just to show, this is, again, the same marginal uh, cost for adding additional solar to the grid. Uh, this orange curve is the one I showed before for, for the somewhat inflexible case. As you make the grid more flexible, you see this just push further out. So now instead of finding an economic limit at 18 to 20 percent, you're out closer to 30 percent. And with even additional flexibility, which is here represented by um, a significant build out of CSP plants with thermal energy storage, you see the curve push even further. Uh, so that, that's looking at um, the value of the energy power from uh, solar has both an energy value and in most markets also a capacity value, um, which is an additional value due to typically solar's um, good match at low penetrations <coughs> to times of peak load. Uh, this study here from Andrew Mills and Ryan, Ryan Weiser at Lawrence Berkeley Lab is from 2012, so it's a little bit old, but the trend is basically the, the capacity credit, the value um, for PV installed to the grid due to its ability to reduce the overall peak demand goes down as steadily down as PV penetration increases. And you know, it's different for different scenarios, but anywhere from 5% to 15 to 20%, there's no longer any value, a capacity value for additional PV generation. To explain, to explain what that means or how that comes from, I'll show these uh, um, example load profiles here. And in gray here, this is, this is load without solar, um, peak load demand. So you see that uh, in terms of determining how much capacity you need to meet peak load demands, um, grid operators will look at this, this peak here you see in green. Now the lines here are, are increasing amounts of solar energy on the grid going from 2% in blue to 14% PV. And for this example, you see that as you add more solar, where that peak steadily decreases until the point, in this case, where you get to 10%, where there's no decrease in where that peak point is between 10 and 14%. So in this case, the capacity value goes down and it is at zero at above 10% uh, PV on the grid. So above 10%, the peak, <coughs> where the peak load position is, no longer changes as you add um, more solar and the capacity value declines. So the opportunity here to sort of combat declining value of PV as generation increases is to continue to reduce costs. And last year, about a year ago, we announced new cost targets for 2030 for PV systems. Cost targets are three cents kilowatt hour for utility scale PV, four cents for commercial systems, and five cents for residential PV systems by 2030. So this is a 50% reduction compared to the 2020 cost targets. Um, so for utility scale PV, it's a 50% reduction from where we are today. For the commercial and residential sectors, uh, it's about a factor of three reduction from green where we, where we are today. And as I talk about these costs, I want to point out that, um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, LCOE, the levelized cost of energy, depends on the climate, depends on where the system is installed. The same system installed in a really sunny area will generate more power. Um, that generation is in the denominator of LCOE, so the overall cost per kilowatt hour goes down. Same system installed in a less uh, sunny area uh, will, will, by the same factor, be more expensive per kilowatt hour that's generated. And at DOE, we are focused on enabling solar energy for all Americans across you know, the US. And so we use average climate for our cost targets. So the three cents a kilowatt hour um, we calculate is for average climate, which we represent by Kansas City, Missouri. That same system installed in really sunny Arizona or California would be almost two cents a kilowatt hour. Similarly, in Seattle, one of our least sunny regions, it'd be four cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, and one of the reasons this is important is if you're thinking about uh, 
costs that you hear reported for um, solar, typically when folks are talking about really low costs that, um, of solar and, and um, PPAs that are being signed at four cents a kilowatt hour, that's almost always for very sunny regions. And it's also typically including the, uh, if it's in the US, the investment tax credit. Uh, so that will cause you, you know, you could hear numbers today of four or five cents a kilowatt hour, but those numbers reported in that way aren't comparable to the targets I'm talking about. And, you know, how much does this matter? How much would cutting costs 50% matter? <coughs> so you get a sense of that. Um, use, again, projections from uh, NREL's regional energy deployment system. And this shows this business as usual case where, again, uh, you know, solar is expected to be about 5% of generation in 2030. With cost being half that uh, in, in, uh, in 2030 instead, so having the cost, you get more than double the solar deployment. In this case, uh, you know, lower solar costs, again, com they, they uh, counteract the decline in value. At three cents a kilowatt hour, solars also would be cheaper than many existing, operating many existing power plants. So it could actually be cheaper to install and use solar energy than to run some existing generators, which could lead to an overall reduction in electricity prices, making electricity more affordable. So I'm going to talk, to, talk about a pathway. How, how would we, um, you know, moving to the technology side, how would we get from where we are today to three cents a kilowatt hour? Is that practical? Like, what would that look like? So walk you through this waterfall. <coughs> and to get from the six cents cost to the three cent target, here's one example pathway. Of course, there are others, but this illustrates what it would take. In this case, we'd be looking for module prices to fall to about 25 cents a watt. Um, this this uh, bucket here, about uh, 0.4 cents, might be too small uh, because it's based on sort of reported prices on the market today, which may not be what we'd call sustainable. So it may actually be a little bit larger. What we're targeting when we target reductions in the module cost, or we're targeting what we call sustainable reductions, which allows for enough profit for module manufacturers and in the supply chain for them to continue to grow capacity. So it's not what they're selling in cases of oversupply on the market, but it's what they would be selling at with enough um, sustainable profits to continue to grow their businesses. So ways in which we can get there, you know, one key way is uh, improving the efficiency of the systems uh, without increasing costs or wall decreasing costs. <coughs> Next bucket here, larger bucket, is lowering the balance of system hardware and soft costs. So this is everything from the inverter, the wiring, the racking of the system, to the installation, interconnection, and permitting costs. Improving the overall system efficiency does help with this bucket as well. Uh, and things like speeding up standardizing installation and interconnection processes can, can help this as well. Third bucket, uh, also a large bucket in, in this scenario, and this is a, an area of particular interest to us at uh, the Department of Energy Solar Office right now, is improving the reliability of the systems. It's a big lever. If you take systems from 30-year lifetime to 50-year lifetimes, you reduce degradation rates to 0.2% a year from a half to 0.75% a year. That can be a big, big lever for cost reduction. And I'll show that in a different way on the, on the next slide. So better understand, ability to understand what causes degradation and also better ability to predict that so that as uh, structures and devices change, we can immediately understand how that impacts um, their reliability. Last is lowering of operations and maintenance costs. It's an important bucket in this case too. And here, uh, employing automation and better data analytics to um, better predict when maintenance is needed and more quickly diagnose issues. Uh, improved characterization tools help as well here. Um, but as I said before, there are a number of pathways to get to uh, um, these targets. And I'll illustrate the, the number of pathways here just from a module technology perspective. So in this plot, 
Um, it's looking at module price on the y-axis and module efficiency on the x-axis and different uh, reliability cases on the curves I'll show. Everything else in this scenario is held constant. So in this case, if you just look at the trade-offs between module price and efficiency for um, a system that is a 50-year lifetime, 0.2% uh, per year degradation rate, you see that you can hit the um, Sunshot 2030 cost targets with a module that's 25% efficient that costs 30 cents a watt. If you have a more efficient module, it can cost more. In this case, 35% efficient, it can cost an extra 5 cents a watt. Conversely, if it's less efficient, if it's more like sort of the average efficiency on the market today is 17%, well, it has to be cheaper. It has to be 20 cents a watt. Illustrating the importance of reliability, here's the same curve for a system that is more like the lifetimes and degradation rates assumed today, 30 years, half a percent per year uh, performance degradation. Here, looking at the 25% module now, instead of 30 cents a watt, um, if all of the uh, change is borne by the module price, it now has to be 13 cents a watt. So it has to be substantially cheaper um, for this lower lifetime case. And if you look at even lower, yet still um, not that low uh, lifetimes, in this case 20-year lifetime, 1% per year, it becomes very difficult to achieve these cost targets. Here, you, you know, if your module were free, it would have to be 27% efficient. Uh, if it was 40% uh, efficient, it, it could only cost about six cents. This is holding everything else constant. Um, lots of folks who get interested in new materials and new system possibilities that um, could be a lot cheaper and might not last as long uh, are also looking at possibilities that would reduce um, installation costs and some of the other costs. Changing some of the other costs, if, if, if this kind of a system enabled that, would push this curve out like this. But I think one of the messages I want to drive home in terms of how important reliability is, is it's going to be very hard to um, achieve the substantial cost reduction targets without systems that are at least as long lived as today, without getting to 30 year lifetimes, 25 to 30 year lifetimes. We also have uh, cost targets for um, residential PV systems, as I showed. And this is just the waterfall here. Uh, again, similar buckets, um, but what you see here is a much much larger bucket than any seen on the pre previous slide, and this is for the soft costs, as I mentioned before, the commercial and residential systems um, have a much larger soft cost component. Just blowing this up to get this kind of a reduction would require major uh, reductions in customer acquisition costs, permitting interconnection taxes, installation labor, the supply chain costs, as well as the profit and overhead costs of um, the installers and developers themselves. The other uh, a uh, bucket that's on here that wasn't on the other um, waterfall is lower finance rates. The cost of capital, the financing of the system is actually a major lever in the overall levelized cost of energy. And if residential systems were able to obtain lower financing rates, if they could be tied into mortgages, things like that, that could also be a big cost reduction lever. Similarly, we have cost targets for CSP systems. Uh, CSP systems are utility scale systems, and you'll notice that the 2030 cost target here is five cents compared to, for PV, the utility scale system is three cents. Uh, the higher cost target is possible because CSP systems have a higher value due to their incorporation of energy storage. So they can be competitive um, at comparatively higher costs. For getting uh, costs down with CSP systems, um, here are some example buckets. It's a big fraction of the cost of a CSP system is the mirrors, the heliostats, the solar field. We have a number of different terms uh, used. But finding cheaper ways to collect the sunlight and concentrate it uh, is, is an area of critical need. Uh, reducing the cost of the power block and improving the efficiency of the power cycle are another, other large buckets. Uh, CSP technology is uh, a great opportunity for that, is to incorporate um, supercritical CO2 power cycles, 
um, that are currently under development. Um, these power cycles are of great interest, not only for CSP, but also nuclear and fossil uh, energies. And they offer opportunity for higher efficiencies as well as higher efficiencies at smaller size. So you don't have to have as large of a plant to reach uh, efficiencies and lower costs. Also, um, we need to see the remaining parts of the system, the thermal energy storage, the receiver, and the operations and maintenance come down. So the next section I'd like to talk about is what I call here the solar storage synergy. Uh, and if you remember this plot I showed earlier on grid flexibility, um, one of the biggest levers, probably the biggest lever for increasing the flexibility of the grid, which in turn enables greater solar deployment, is storage. Um, however, today, storage costs are really too high to see large-scale deployment of storage. But um, one form of storage battery costs are falling dramatically. And so we've looked at what would happen if these large cost reductions in battery storage or other forms of storage, but batteries are the example here, continued. So here's the um, projections of solar deployment, the percent of US electricity from solar in the low cost solar case of hitting the SunShot 2030 goals, where we get to three cents a kilowatt hour for PV in 2030 and two cents a kilowatt hour PV in 2050. If we throw low cost storage on top, where low cost storage in this case is getting to uh, a system install cost of $100 a kilowatt hour in 2040. That's about a factor of four reduction in storage costs by 2040. What you see, of course, is that there's dramatically greater solar deployment. Um, uh, this is you know, somewhat of an arbitrary choice of scenario, but just illustrating what a large lever for solar deployment at the same cost of solar, you see substantially more deployment with low cost storage. Uh, this is just illustrating uh, what the um, assumed battery storage capital costs are for this scenario. So the, um, uh, the bold lines are uh, from Wesley Cole at NREL's study looking at overall projections for energy storage costs. So those are mid-case projections or the solid lines. And the dashed lines here is the low-cost <laughs> scenario, where for utility-scale storage, it's hitting $100 a kilowatt hour in 2040. That's for an eight-hour battery. Um, whereas commercial and residential assume three-hour storage. So, as I just mentioned, more sol storage uh, leads to more solar. Um, storage does this by providing a sink for curtailed solar. So rather than just throwing away excess solar, you can charge the batteries and then use it at times when power is needed. But I say this is the solar storage synergy um, because it actually goes in the other direction as well. As you put more solar on the grid, there's more market opportunity for storage. And I'll uh, explain why on the next slides. And in addition to that, actually coupling solar plus storage systems together offers some opportunity for cost reduction in some of the soft costs uh, and possibly even in some of the hardware like the, the inverter. So instead of deploying them independently when they're actually deployed together, you may have cost reduction opportunities. But in terms of understanding why increasing solar increases the market opportunity for storage, I'll come back to this plot here where we see here's net, um, the net load and how the net load changes when you add more solar. <coughs> now just going to the case of no solar and the case of um, solar with about 10% of PV. And what, what you see here is um, it's looking effectively at capacity value. So to have about a two gigawatt reduction in peak capacity, the capacity value for storage, in the case without solar, requires a, in, in this particular illustration, requires about a five to six hour um, storage lifetime. With solar, this load peak decreases, uh, load peak narrows, so now, it's two and a half to three hours storage that are needed, which for the same overall peak reduction. So for the same capacity value, you don't need a battery that can last as long, um, which is an easier requirement on storage costs. And Paul Denholm from NREL has looked at this across electricity markets and found this trend holds broadly 
even across markets for which load shape can vary significantly. Uh, so in all these cases, these bars here represent going from zero solar pen penetration up to 20%. And after the initial, in some cases, there's an initial decrease. And basically, in all cases, you see that as solar goes up, um, the market for storage, in this case, uh, it's four-hour storage, the market, for stor market size for storage goes up. And uh, as part of uh, getting to a conclusion, I want to talk or just sort of end with a uh, discussion of really what I see the tremendous potential for solar. I've shown some of this already, but just talk a little bit more about what could be possible with aggressive innovation in solar and synergistic technologies like storage, but that allow for greater grid flexibility. Um, I'll be talking a little bit more about this. Uh, deployment projection modeling that we've been looking at. And just before I do, these are models, uh, modeling tools at the National Renewable Energy Lab at NREL. It's the regional energy deployment system is the primary tool here. And this is um, an optimization model that looks at what is the lowest cost way to basically meet electricity needs to balance supply and demand, maintain power quality across the US. Uh, and it um, explicitly deals with renewable energy <coughs> integration issues and variability by having a large number of time slices over which it does its balancing. Um, and looks at transmission build outs as well across 134 balancing areas. What it does not do well is project deployment on the distribution system. And so it's coupled with a model called DGEN that looks at um, adoption of distributed solar. And these are the same projections I showed earlier. Um, based on these models, baseline, uh, again, baseline sort of expectations here, low cost solar, low cost solar, and this particular case of low cost storage. Showing again by 2050 in these scenarios, um, low cost solar alone could enable 30% of electricity demand by 2050. With a more flexible grid, this number only goes up. And in the case of low cost storage, could be over 50%. Now, of course, the one uh, consistent thing about projections is they're always wrong. Uh, they account for many, 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 many factors. And the baseline case is, so as I said, only guaranteed to be wrong. You know, it's looking at uh, expected costs for. Uh, the whole suite of um, energy generation technologies, expected electricity demand, um, and how that changes over time, uh, a large number of factors, all of which are subject to change. So in this case, we did um, a sensitivity analysis that looked at uh, a wide number of um, potential changes and uh, came up with sort of a wide range of possible outcomes, all for the same low-cost solar, low-cost storage case. The general trends, however, remain clear, that decreasing the cost of solar leads to substantially more <coughs> solar deployments, making the grid more flexible, decreasing the cost of uh, storage um, leads to more solar deployment for the same solar costs. And this is just uh, a plot looking at the build out of um, PV for these sets of projections. And uh, so here we see projections to date, uh, the, um, you know, where we're in the less than 10 tens of gigawatts. You see you know, a, a large expected growth in solar deployments um, over the years uh, around 2020. This is due to costs continuing to fall while the investment tax credit makes solar effectively even lower cost. Um, then, you see some drop off and then another build out uh, here expected when as solar costs continue to decline and reach a level at which solar becomes competitive even with um, generation from uh, some existing sources. And here is where you see at this point the value of solar is falling in the case of um, an inflexible grid and you'll see in these orange bars that solar deployment would fall, but in the case of a more flexible grid, low cost storage, that solar deployment could stay, could stay at this higher rates. Again, projections with all the usual caveats here. 
But one thing I did want to show from these projections is that solar build out is not just occurring in a few places in the country. When we get to low cost solar, low cost solar plus storage, you see deployment across the country. And this is um, colored where darker colors mean that more of that state's electricity demand is met by solar, lighter is less. Um, in this case, uh, goes from about 3% to 60% depending on the state. And here these numbers are, are even, even higher. So solar, you know, you really do see solar deployment across the country. And I'll end just talking a little bit more about the solar office at DOE and some opportunities that might be of interest to some of you. Uh, so just introducing uh, what we do. Um, as Raf said, we were uh, commonly known as Sunshot. Uh, until recently, and you know, with the accomplishment of the utility scale solar goal and with cost reduction no longer being the only important uh, factor for solar, we're uh, using more our, our solar office name. And so what we do is we support early stage research and development of solar technologies that strengthen grid reliability, resilience, and security. We do this through primarily through funding opportunities. We have um, what we call funding opportunity announcements, or FOAs, uh, that, are competi that are open to applications, um, uh, certainly from MIT and generally to the general community. Uh, they're open for applications. They fund different critical research areas, which we identify. Um, but broadly, you know, aiming at continuing to lower electricity costs, integrate solar energy into the grid, uh, and enhance the use and storage of solar electricity. We have um, what's uh, being called science, technology, policy opportunities. We have what's been, um, for the last several years, a great fellowship program in our office that I wanted to talk about and um, would love to talk to any of you who might be interested. Uh, and please do spread the word. This is a, it's a fellowship opportunity to come and work in our office. Um, it's both for recent graduates as well as folks who have um, been in the field for a while. Recent graduates at the undergraduate or PhD um, level, as well as folks who have more experience. We also have a, a senior fellow equivalent program. And you come, you work directly in our office, and have the opportunity to really be exposed to this broad, big picture, to think about what are the big challenges um, in solar energy research, and then to work with our team to des define and design new funding strategies, uh, as well as to help manage our funding program. So it's a great opportunity to get involved in you know, um, looking at and shaping where millions of dollars of research will go and, and new research directions. Uh, we've had really fantastic folks come through this program. It's a, it's a two-year program. And, uh, and you know, people have done all kinds of things afterwards. A lot of them have, have stayed in our office and have grown into all kinds of uh, different roles. And people have um, done a variety of other things as well. But I, I, you know, I'd be delighted to talk with any of you who are interested or feel free to send me an email. Our next application deadline is uh, January 15th. And the program is run through ORISE. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a website here. And again, uh, you can feel free to follow up with me if you don't uh, get that down and you're interested in more info. We do have one funding opportunity open the moment. And this is actually a new area of funding for us, uh, solar desalination. This funding opportunity, it's a $15 million funding opportunity. And it's looking at utilizing concentrating solar technology uh, to desalinate water. So um, leveraging uh, solar thermal technology either to directly um, drive desalination processes or uh, coupling um, thermal desalination processes with solar thermal generation uh, to utilize some of the, the waste heat of the solar thermal generation and more cost effectively generate uh, clean water. So this is uh, an exciting new area for us. And concept papers, which are short, I believe, five-page descriptions of a proposal and an idea, are due in about a month, if you're interested. Um, the way our funding cycles work is 
we have a concept paper cycle, and then concept papers are either encouraged or discouraged to submit full applications. So you'll get some initial feedback on that idea, and then um, full applications can be submitted. Whether you're encouraged or discouraged, you can submit a full, a full application based on that feedback, but we provide that feedback to help folks know whether or not it may be worth their time to develop a, develop a full proposal. So uh, I will uh, end here. I just want to acknowledge we have a fantastic uh, team at DOE that's contributed to all the work I've talked about, as well as some really excellent analysts at NREL um, whose work has been uh, what I've been highlighting here, Wesley Cole, Paul Denholm, Dave Feldman, Robert Margolis, and Mike Woodhouse. Well, thank you very much.